Okay, thank you, Sebastian, for passing along here. Um, yeah, so uh, Sebastian talked about the evolution of um, the, I guess, evolution, large evolution of leeches. I'm going to talk a little bit about evolution in humans, um, ideas of fairness, and the COVID vaccine, as you see in the title here. Um, Okay, there we go. And uh, this is all coming out. I, just, I, I published a book, uh, you can see it, Finding Fairness from Pleistine Forge of the Contemporary Capitalist. That just came out in February. And as it was coming out, a lot of things that I was doing was trying to think through some of the implications that I had written about the book and how it, how it impacted, uh, um, how, how our lives were being impacted with COVID. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But more or less the argument of the book, and I'll go in greater detail, is that our ideas about fairness, our ideas about how to treat people right, um, are, are to, a, to, a, uh, to some degree evolved. And so then we look at the last 8 million years ago, 8 million years as we began to separate from other, other primates, what you're seeing is a slow and then a far more rapid accumulation of ideas about such things as cooperation and trust that built the idea of human fairness. And then what the book does is the book basically then tracks that over the last 20,000 years after the end of the last ice age and looking at some of the big moments in human history. So uh, when we first settled down into smaller territories, we build cities, capitalism, and trying to see how institutions that were built for uh, around fairness changed during these pivotal moments um, of, of, of history. And what, um, what I'm gonna argue today is that I think we're another pivotal, pivotal moment here I've talked about things like systemic racism, uh, things like uh, climate change, but also COVID. All these things coming together are beginning to, to, to make a lot of people think about some of the institutions, especially some of the global institutions that we have, um, may need to be fixed in order to deal with the, the world that we live in today. So what I'll do then is I'm just going to go ahead and give you uh, a sense of the broader argument. And then for the last let's say five minutes or so, focus really on COVID and what this has to do with COVID because a lot of people are probably saying understandably, well, you know, what do, what do people living a million years ago have to say about COVID today? And I think they actually have a fair amount and I'll try to explain that. Um, and so more or less the idea is that long-term collaboration depends on group members being treated fairly, okay? That um, if you're gonna actually have a group that sustains itself over over a few years, over a few decades, they've got to feel as if they're being treated right. Uh, now, of course, what's fair, you know, put that in quotes there, is determined by many factors, right? It's history and its environment, the size of the community, things like this. But one significant factor is our evolved con uh, conceptions about what is right and wrong and how we should treat others and how we expect to be treated. And what I'm going to suggest here is that the mind developed in the Pleistocene environment. So the environment there right before the Holocene, right before um, the current era, where it was very dynamic, uh, small populations uh, of people that were fairly mobile, or very mobile hunter-gatherers, and they lived in an environment of familiar hierarchy, fierce egalitarianism, widespread frequent collaboration, within group trust and allegiance, task-based leadership, okay? So uh, don't have too much time to get in, but you have a sense here of, of um, you know, for example, children obeying, uh, obeying their parents as adolescent increases, people trying to work together um, as much as possible, and sometimes having leaders, for example, to, to do a hunt or to organize the creation of a, of a shelter. Um, and what I want to argue here is that fair institutions are still being evaluated by some of these same criteria, even though the conditions around those criteria have radically changed. And, and, I, and I hope to be, make it a little bit more clear with a little bit of a, of, of a case study that follows. But the idea here is that the rules of the game are gonna change. So institutions, uh, a way in which we sometimes, uh, the, the, the sort of easy definition of institution is, is the rules of the game of society. Those rules change based on conditions as you move from being mobile hunter-gatherers to moving into cities in places like Africa, as this, as this uh, photo shows here, you're gonna change the ways in which you live radically. Uh, but what I'm saying is that the ways in which we think of changes of being appropriate and acceptable along the way are guided by a sense of fairness that is, that is, is, that is at least in part evolved. Okay, and so uh, what I want to suggest here 
is is give you one example. Uh, you know, in a, in a in a you know a book that, of course, I can't explain everything, but an example of think with fairness and allegiance, which is going to be very important in a little bit when we talk about COVID. Um, and so, there's a long-term trend in human evolution of increasing group size and territory. Okay, you go from from fairly small territories with with uh, small um, troops of people, think about chimpanzee groups. And over time, what happens, there are more and more people that are, that are thought of as being within the group. And that territory that they, their foraging territory began to expand uh, larger and larger. And what that meant is that there was a lot of what sometimes they call fusion and fission within a group. So that it's not only a very big group, but you have a lot of people coming together, to coming apart throughout the course of a week or a course of a season. And oftentimes those relationships are different each time. Um, so that you have to remember who's in your group to build that trust. You have to, you have to uh, know what's going on to build that cooperation. So a lot of the idea about human evolution and, and, and the brain is about, is about cooperation and about, uh, and about fairness and about understanding that social environment. That's what may have been a key driver in the increase in brain size. And what some scholars talk about is things like music, language, art, style, for example, style of, of, a, of a stone point or, or rock art, uh, or what, what's sometimes called a release from proximity to create larger collaborative groups. Think of chimpanzees, where chimpanzees, most of what they do in terms of building cooperation and trust, they're grooming each other, right? They have to be next to each other uh, a fair amount in order to build that, build those relationships. What humans have done is created uh, ways in, in order to bond with each other across distance. And this allowed us over time over the course uh, from even before the Pleistocene, we see this trend towards, towards bigger and bigger groups. And then we have those mechanisms in place in order to, to keep that cooperation, keep those groups intact. So that if we go ahead and blast past the Pleistocene into modern humans and some of the issues we're gonna talk about, the notion here is that group identity therefore is always gonna be in flux, right? You have this fission and fusion, you have people coming in and coming out, you have um, warfare, orphans, you have whatever the mechanism might be, people are always trying to decide who is and who is not in my group. And that as group sizes get bigger, oftentimes we have new institutions. Think of, of, of religions or think of markets, whatever it might be, that help the scaling up, help, help to find ways in which to, to create stronger bonds, stronger connections between the people that are in those groups. Now, what's so important here? Um, is that remember from what I said earlier, is that group members expected to be treated right. They expect to be treated fairly. If I'm a member of, of my group, from an evolutionary perspective, I expect to have um, to be treated in a certain way. Uh, with the, you know, that if I'm if I participate in these in these actions, or if I'm a member of this group, for example, I should get some sort of reward uh, from group activities. Um, but as we scale up groups, there are oftentimes there's a lot of debate about who is and who is not a group member, right? As suddenly we go ahead and say, okay, now we're all participating in, in this market together. Does that mean we're a group? Some people will say yes, some people will say no. And that's that tension there because, I'm, because if you're not a member of a group, I can treat you differently than if I'm a member of your group. So you can see that tension beginning to, to, to exasperate as you get bigger and bigger groups and the fuzziness of those of, of, of who is and who is not begins to escalate. Um, and then as you're doing that, you're also recalibrating what it means to be fair. So there's two kinds of equality, right? That, that oftentimes people talk about. Equality of outcome, that we each get the same slice of the pie, uh, no matter what we've done, because we're a member of the group and equality of opportunity, which is something like, okay, well, we all have the same, the same possibility to get to get more pie. I worked harder, therefore I should get a bigger piece of the pie. Um, and so a lot of these debates that, that uh, we have today, you can see that there's a lot of debate about what equality means in Canada today are also being had uh, all the way at, at, into the time of very mobile hunter, hunter gatherers at the very, at the very, begin, at very end of the ice age. Um, but as you change group size, as you change that, that membership, as you try to navigate that, you're also trying to change exactly, well, how do we, how do we make, make things fair in this group now that things are different, now that institutions are different, now that the number of people is different? And that's an ongoing conversation that people have in society. Um, 
And so here's an old classic image, uh, you know, that uh, uh, from this guy, Marshall Sellins, talking about really village-based societies. But this is this gives you some sense. Each one of those dots is, is a person. And you can see that as you move out of the house, the house is this sort of sense, okay, these people are clearly my group. I'm going to clearly uh, take care of them. I'm not going to think, think much of it. But as you get further and further away, now you're going to think, okay, I'm not sure if they're in the group. I'm going to make sure I get something of an equal value for whatever I, whatever I give. That's the balanced reciprocity. As I get further away, when the people are not in my group, it's negative reciprocity, which is it's actually a, a weird term, which means, well, I'm going to try to take advantage as much as possible because these people are not my people. Okay, so you can see this playing out. Like it's a very simple diagram. You can see this playing out oftentimes today and certainly was happening in the past. And this is going to all link back here in just a second uh, to COVID here. Because the one thing that we've seen time and time again is, is people will say to me, um, you know, after, after the book has come out is, well, hold on a second. Um, I know a lot of examples of people not treating other people right. And my response is that often, but not all the time, but often the, the idea is that the, the, the focus is on the other, right? And not so much on, on the people. Is that think about the Romans, for example, this, uh, in this image here, is that if you go ahead and you call other people barbarians or, or whatever it might be, if you go ahead and create that distance and say they're other people, you, uh, the other people that are not like you, they're not on your team, then suddenly you're able to do things to them that you would not do to your own group. So what you often see throughout history is this, are these attempts in order to, to create these really strong borders, these really strong differences between us and them, because then the rules don't apply in the same ways to other people than they do to your own people. Okay. Now, what this is, this is my house of cards picture for what it's worth, is that as, but the idea is that as you go further and further away, think about that other side about going from family. Oh, yes, they're clearly in my group to the village. Oh, yes, they're in my group. And then as you go further out, the maximal group, the biggest group that you have is often the most fragile of groups. Uh, it's often a group that you're not really sure you belong to. And so that it's most apt to break down into, into some of these smaller groups like the village or like the family that maybe you hold more, more dear, maybe it's more clearly thought of, hey, that is actually my people. And so, and, and of course, what often happens, this is my, my attempt, I, I don't have Sebastian's skill with the videos here, but I wanted to create this house of cards, turn it to a house on fire, because in the sense of what happens here is that, that oftentimes when push comes to shove, right, when you have, an, a, you have a moment of, um, of stress, that this is when you make decisions about, okay, who is and who is not on my team? You may have said, oh yeah, we're one big, we're one big group, one big family, but then uh, something like this happens, disaster happens, then you start really seeing, okay, where group boundaries are, are being placed, okay? And we've seen this time and time again. Okay, so maybe you see where I'm going here, but I am finally gotten to COVID here. Um, because the COVID vaccine, what I'm, uh, sorry, the COVID is in many ways that, that house fire, is, is that moment uh, where you can say, okay, who is and who is not in my group? Uh, you, it, things begin to clarify in these, in these moments of great stress. Um, and so I wanna talk uh, in the last five minutes or so about vaccination and global vaccination um, work because I think then some of these insights about fairness and how fairness, uh, the evolution of fairness and how it, how it applies is very relevant um, to our case here. Because as some, as some may remember, it seems like a long time ago, but September, 2020, you know, long before we had any vaccinations in place, the World Health Organization unveils their global vaccination plan. Um, more than two thirds of the countries had joined, um, you know, soon after there were pledges of billions of vaccines, millions of dollars, it's widely lauded for its equity, right? Is that this is a plan that everybody in September was getting behind. And, and a lot of the epidemiologists and experts are saying, hey, look, wow, that this plan is actually gonna be, be better for everybody because it's a global, global problem. In order to, to deal with this effectively, we need to find a global solution. And they came up with this plan. You don't have to go into too much of these, but this was the plan. This was the idea in September. Um, in December, I wrote an article, art, 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 uh, short piece for this uh, um, journal, uh, not journal, it's a 
a website, sort of a news aggregate site called The Conversation. And it was talking about this very idea. I said uh, that basically that things are going to break down, that this COVID vaccine, the, the WHO plan is a great plan, but it's not going to work because of the ways in which we think of fairness from an evolved point of view. And what I, what I was getting at in that to a degree and can articulate a, a little bit more now for you was that the WHO's plan depended on this sort of global identity and a global identity that in particular was hung on the United Nations, right? The, who is a, it's an arm of the United Nations. The United Nations, as everyone knows, you know, everyone gets a seat at the table, everything sounds good and we're gonna go ahead and solve, solve the world's problems. Um, but as, as everyone also does know is that there are issues internally um, of, with the United Nations that's made it oftentimes very ineffective. Now it's very effective in terms of its funding, right? It gets most of its funding from, from places like the United States. So there's not equal amounts of sort, for sort of percent of, of contributions per income for these various nations. Uh, so that there's a lot of, lot of sense and fairness built into the ways in which people contribute. There's also most fundamentally the Security Council, right? A, 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 a just a small group of, of, of nations with veto power that is seen uh, as markedly unfair. And think about it within the group, uh, you know, idea once again, is that from an equity point of view, is that if you're trying to make this a group that makes sense for people from an involved perspective, it's not a very well, a uh, very, very good way to make the group because there's already in inequities built into it. The people are then going to say, well, this really isn't a good organization. This really isn't a fair organization. And they, and, and when push comes to shove, what do you think happens? Um, uh, and so this, the far stronger uh, aspect of the United Nations, of course, for all the members are, are members of, of nation states. And so that as nation states, um, this is what you worry about is that suddenly that that global, that global system is gonna start breaking down and these nation states that build up and make that global system are gonna start thinking just for themselves. And so we did have, you know, I'm, I'm uh, Signaling out the United Nations, uh, sorry, United States of America, simply more because they have this this graphic here from another article from the conversation that shows uh, some of the vaccination models in the form of, the, of 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 the states. But you all see the same thing you've seen in India right now. You're seeing it in England. You see all these places that are producing the vaccine are starting. The European Union are starting to hedge their bets. Um, and as and, and as I said, I saw that in in December by saying, "Hey, look, it's not going to work out." because those global institutions are not very firm. They're not built in the way, in, in the right way in order to deal with evolved notions of what is the right thing to do within, within a group setting. And so then, then to conclude here, I think the notion that I'm trying to get at is that it's probably too late. I mean, you know, certainly too late for, for um, you know, COVID vaccine. I don't think Joe Biden or whoever it might be is listening to this and gonna open up uh, and change the, the strategies that are being in place in these different nations. But what it does, I think, um, illustrate, at least to me, is that you can look at the evolution of, of fairness. You can look at the ways in which institutions have been built over the last 20,000 years and say to yourself, okay, how do we, how do we create better global institutions in order to deal with the big global problems that we face today? And I think that if we go ahead and, and look at uh, the ideas of fairness, look at the ideas of institutions that worked to deal with some of the broader problems that people have faced over the last, last 20,000 years, we can actually begin to build far better, more resilient global structures that can help us deal with some of the big problems that we face because, of course, once we're done with COVID, we still got a big lineup of things to deal with, uh, like some of the, uh, like, like climate change. So I'll, I'll end there. Uh, thank you, everyone. I probably should have thanked you at the very beginning for, for attending and for, um, for being a part of this uh, pandemic conversation. I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and uh, uh, pass the baton off to Burton Lim, who's going to, I believe, talk about uh, bats and some of the work with bats and, uh, and, the, and the coronavirus. So, um, so thanks again.